Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I hope it's a good afternoon. I'm Eckhart Grohl. I serve as the head of mechanical engineering here at Purdue, and it's my distinct pleasure today uh, to introduce the moderator of our panel discussion, who uh, will then introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, so the moderator is uh, Professor Hector Gomez. Uh, he's originally from Spain and got educated in Spain, uh, but eventually, uh, just like uh, many, many others, uh, including myself, came over to the U.S. He joined Purdue in 2016 uh, as an associate professor in mechanical engineering and is uh, one of our wonderful, uh, still I will call him uh, young uh, scholars and uh, educators in our degree program. Uh, he, in his uh, short career, has already received numerous awards for his academic excellence. Uh, but I wanted to point out one that is actually not on my uh, on my brief bio, and so. Uh, but uh, uh, I recently had to introduce him someplace else, and I recall uh, the Princess of Girona Award from Spain, uh, where actually the King of Spain is involved, and where he helps attract young people into the area of engineering or STEM in general, and it's really quite an accomplishment. It's actually uh, an award that goes across the entire STEM discipline, and he was uh, selected as a young, very outstanding uh, mechanical, or uh, now mechanical engineer, as he got actually educated as a civil engineer, I heard, but uh, eventually he came over to the right area. Uh, so. Uh, with that, I uh, will let Hector take it over and uh, introduce the panelists uh, over here. Hector, uh, thank you very much for doing this. Is this working? Can you hear me? No? Maybe? Okay. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Grohl, for uh, your very nice introduction. Uh, so welcome everyone to the panel. Today we're going to be talking about the future of computational engineering. So computer simulations are nowadays uh, used basically in the design process of every manufactured object. They are also considered to be the third pillar of science together with theory of ob and observation. And we will try to discuss today how computational engineering is going to change engineering, science, and perhaps also medicine in the next few years. So we have an amazing panel uh, to discuss that today. So if I wanted to do a proper introduction of everyone, I think I would spend the entire hour. So I'm gonna keep the introductions uh, minimal. Uh, so we have our distinguished uh, lecture speaker, Professor Tom Hughes. He is the Peter O'Donnell Chair in Computational and Applied Mathematics and a professor in aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at UT Austin. He's one of the most widely cited authors in engineering science, and among many, many, many other honors, he is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. We have Professor Arzu Ardekani. Uh, she is an associate professor in the mechanical engineering department and her expertise is in uh, complex flows, uh, multi-phase flows, and uh, fluid mechanics in general. Uh, we have Professor Zikian Kai. He is a professor in the mathematics department, and he works on numerical analysis and computational mechanics. We have Professor Arun Prakash, associate professor in uh, the civil engineering department with expertise in computational mechanics and structural dynamics. Uh, professor Vitali Reis, he's an assistant professor of biomedical, en biomedical engineering and he directs the cardiovascular flow modeling laboratory. Uh, professor Thomas Sigmund, uh, professor in mechanical engineering, he's a leading expert in uh, mechanics of engineering materials. And we have uh, Professor uh, Ganesh Shubarayan, he's a professor in the mechanical engineering department and his expertise is in solid mechanics and computer-aided design with applications in microelectronics. So we uh, would like also to interact with the audience. So if you have questions, uh, please uh, let me know. I think 
Uh, you have also index cards where you can write your questions. Those will be brought to me so I can ask those questions at some point to the panel. Uh, so let's uh, get started. Uh, I'm going to start with a question for our panelists. So I would like to start with a personal perspective from the panelists so that they can, uh, you can get to know them a little bit better. So they have been in the field of computational engineering for some time. They have, they have seen how the field has changed, all the things that uh, were done differently maybe a few years ago. But uh, I want to somehow ask the opposite question, which is uh, how has computational engineering changed your life and your career over the years? So uh, maybe we can start with uh, our invited speaker, Professor Hughes. Okay, um, my uh, life in computational engineering goes back a long way. It goes back over 50 years. So if I tell you all about it and how it changed my life, we'd be here all night. <laughs> uh, it's really interesting because uh, when I got started, uh, computer methods were rather a small part of engineering, I'd say. And of course, uh, one looks back now and sees it uh, pervasive throughout engineering. But it, it wasn't always that way. And you might have thought that the path was easy and obvious, but it really wasn't. There were a lot of ba battles and a lot of resistance to uh, developments in computational engineering. But I would say one thing, uh, every area in which computing has really penetrated, it has in fairly short time, in retrospect, maybe 10 years or so, it has dramatically <coughs> changed the field. Uh, things that were experimentally based, like elasticity, where you would do photoelasticity experiments, became uh, analytical and uh, completely done with com com computer technology. So it, it's, uh, it's revolutionized every area that I've had any contact with in engineering and it continues to do so. And now it's uh, gone to other areas that are uh, very exciting, uh, such as medicine. And that's been going on for quite some time too in different branches of medicine. But uh, if you, when we get to the future, that's one of the, the big areas. I mean, I, I, I think uh, computing methods are, are going to continue to grow. Uh, computers are still getting more powerful. And the opportunity to apply them to more and more complicated problems and to gather data to support that uh, is greater than ever. So I, I think it's, uh, it's just changed the world already. It's probably the biggest development in uh, the second half of the, the 20th century, you know. More opinions? Opinions about how it changed our life? Yeah, or yeah, about, yeah. Okay. So I, I can go next. Um, so I got into the field of fluid dynamics after I started uh, my PhD. Uh, before that, when I was undergrad, I wanted to, uh, to be a roboticist. Uh, but then after uh, learning about uh, fluid dynamics, I started actually with theoretical work. Um, my first few publications were all theory. And uh, I didn't know much about computational fluid dynamics until I uh, got a course and um, learned more about it. Uh, but as I was doing more and more uh, theory and learning the techniques out there, I realized that even though there are lots of nice things that can be done uh, with theory because then you get the scaling, you are able to come up with answers um, much quicker and understanding of the physics of the pro problem, there are many other aspects where uh, you cannot extend your theory uh, to uh, limits of large uh, dimensionless parameters like Reynolds number, Weisenberg number, many other, other parameters. So that's how we started doing uh, computational fluid dynamics. Um, and, um, I, one of the area that I, uh, I have interest in is um, biofluid dynamics. And at the time, many people started looking at, um, uh, again, theoretical aspect of biofluid uh, mechanics. And we were one of the first looking at um, biolocomotion and biofluid dynamics from computational uh, perspective. And now uh, there, there are many, many uh, groups who are looking at that um, computationally. So that's how uh, computational engineering or computational biofluid uh, mechanics um, has changed my own career. Anyone else want to share about computational engineering? Just uh, my experience, when I was a grad student, 
I was very interested in computational sciences, so I was trained to do computational sciences, but I didn't really see, the, I didn't have the experience to see the impact of it. When I went to work in industry after grad school, I worked in a department that was doing finite element analysis on a daily basis, and what uh, the company was trying to do, I worked for IBM, what the company was trying to do was to use computational modeling, this is about 30 years ago, was trying to use computational modeling to reduce product development cycle times. From So the whole idea was somehow reduce the product development cycle times. And that has actually come down significantly. In other words, in terms of the expertise that is required to do that sort of simulation has now, now come down. Now we are seeing average undergraduate engineers work in companies with the aim of using computational tools to reduce product development cycle times significantly. And I think computational mechanics has been very successful in making that possible. I think Professor Reitz wanted yeah, to I say I wanted something. to say that for me, computational analysis and mechanics um, allowed me to bridge the gap between engineering and medicine. Uh, I'm an engineer by training, but I was interested in uh, physiology and, uh, and medicine. And um, computational mechanics allows us to apply laws of physics and engineering to clinical problems, which would not be possible without a computer. We would not be able to apply laws of physics to realistic anatomical geometries, complex flows, complex um, interplay of different physical phenomena. And that's the tool that um, bridges the gap between uh, theory and, um, and clinical practice. Yeah, I think this is actually one of the things that we wanted to talk more about. What is going to be the impact of computational engineering in medicine over the next few years? Uh, so we have seen that a lot of research labs in the world, they are using computational methods to uh, develop new drugs, to study uh, to, uh, methods for drug delivery, etc. And we have also seen uh, the interaction between computational methods and imaging technology. And I wanted to uh, bring this discussion to the panel. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to use a quote from Professor Hughes that I heard some time ago that goes like this. So uh, he, he said, I see uh, patient-specific computational modeling as a natural and inevitable extension of medical imaging. So I would like you to share your thoughts on that. Do you want to comment on your uh, quote? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I never said that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm sure I did say something like that. Anyway, <clears throat> um, it's really interesting if you think about uh, what imaging has done. I don't think it's fully appreciated. We've just gotten used to it. You know, you get an MRI when you throw your shoulder out or something like that. But medical imaging is, is the window on human anatomy, physiology. Uh, once you can see things, just like in every other science, like in biology with a microscope or uh, astronomy with a telescope, once you can see things and create a geometry, you can build models of that. And you can bring to bear all the engineering and predictive technologies to the field of medicine. <clears throat> medicine is a, is a field that has been traditionally statistically based and diagnostic in its approach. But once you can do predictive uh, tools, bring predictive tools to the party, then you can say things about the future. You can predict the outcome of an intervention. You can do virtual simulation of various interventions and compare them. You can diagnose on a computer. You can compute blood flow. You can compute many things that could only be measured experimentally, maybe in a cath lab or something like that. <clears throat> and also, uh, imaging is, is much like computer technology. I think everybody's heard of Moore's Law in computer technology. It's this advance of the power of microprocessors. We have the same things going on in various imaging modalities. They're getting better. The resolution gets more and more refined as time goes on. So again, that's a platform. If you're researching in this area, that platform is rising you up, even if you're not doing much new yourself. But when you do, are doing things new with this more and more power that you have at your fingertips, 
then uh, you can make enormous progress. And, and I think, uh, like other fields, like engineering fields, medicine will be revolutionized by computational medicine. It has started, but we've just seen the tip of the iceberg. I mean, it's, it, this is a, a fantastic opportunity area. It'll change the way we diagnose, treat, uh, enormous effect on human health. Be prepared to have a complete mathematical model of yourself <laughs> on computers. And uh, Facebook will have access to it, and Google will have aspect, <laughs> access to it. So will the NSA. They'll be watching you. <laughs> but there'll be some good coming out of that, too. Well, we hear uh, more, of, more uh, often like words like in silico medicine or uh, virtual human which um, basically now it's possible just um, as um, uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, because like we went from uh, megaflop calculations in uh, 1970 to now uh, a petaflop that is being discussed and uh, supercomputers that are built at data scales. So uh, computations of data scale will allow us to basically um, uh, use uh, virtual humans for uh, drug delivery tasks, for drug discovery tasks, for um, diagnostic uh, and all of those would be possible because of this change. Like in fields like aerospace industry or other fields, like uh, we always use numerical, or it's been a while we've been using numerical wind tunnels, for example, for uh, low Mach number or high Mach number experiments, or um, Boeing was able to reduce the number of tests from 18, um, 1980s to, to 10 to 19. 1990s and uh, even less these days, but it's less uh, commonly used by um, uh, in the field of medicine by either by medical uh, in industries or by pharmaceutical industries or physicians. And this is now possible and that's why we hear more like something that was surprising to me uh, maybe five years ago, we needed to uh, try harder to convince industry, well, doing a computational work is valuable and can give them useful results. But uh, very recently, um, executive director of one of the large uh, pharmaceutical companies were at Purdue, and he was talking about uh, w what we need in the future, and his exact word that we need uh, in silico uh, drug discovery or uh, uh, other aspects of uh, medicine. And so we don't need anymore to convince people, oh, these are useful. Um, they, they know the value of computational engineering. And if I can add to that. So essentially, we were turning uh, medicine into an exact science. Uh, it, um, it's more like an art with all due respect, and that's nothing bad in that. But uh, very often, uh, neurosurgeons or, I mean, surgeons or radiologists uh, base their decisions on intuition, experience, but they don't have objective quantitative measures. And by extending imaging, with uh, computations, we can actually provide objective measures, objective indices, uh, physics-based um, guidelines that, that we can provide them. And so, and also importantly, it will be personalized medicine. So we can actually uh, compute uh, biomechanical conditions for a particular subject. So it's a patient-based medicine. It's important for risk stratification. It's important for uh, tailoring uh, a device or a drug to a specific uh, patient. So following up, following up on this question, so we have in the panel experts on uh, simulation of cardiovascular flows. We have also Professor Sigmund, who is an expert on bone mechanics. Uh, my question for you would be, what do you think is going to be uh, the next uh, area of medicine in which computational engineering is going to have like very significant impact? One of the challenge areas that I see is that in a living system, uh, we have to consider aspects that are different from an engineering system, right? So engineering systems are built and pretty much done today, right? They are delivered as they are. In, in medical systems, there's a homeostasis and things change, they grow or are absorbed. I think there are, there are good challenges out there in that direction for computations, and they have to go over a longer time than we are potentially used to do a stress analysis or reliability analysis for a, of a given amount of time. We still have challenges in that even in engineering to predict long-term uh, aspects of structures often enough. So I think in, 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 this, in the medicine world, 
this is, I think, a good, really good challenge to have. And in playing this the back play way backward, I think there's something uh, for engineers to learn from to to learn from that as well. If we can understand the physical principles behind such structures, for example, that can regenerate each other and live in a homeostasis instead of living in a fixed state once delivered. And that has computational resource challenges. This has challenges of, of non-locality in bone, for example, what is sensing of, of the image. It's not a local phenomenon on a crack tip of a micro crack. Uh, that uh, information is relayed through piezoelectric effects potentially or through and cell uh, attachments through long distances. And so there are good, good challenges out there. So yeah. I would think that um, there are a few areas uh, in the near future, and one would be, as we already mentioned, uh, optimization and design of biomedical devices, uh, targeted drug delivery. Um, personalization, customization of uh, treatment for patients. That's one. Another would be um, understanding the disease, uh, predicting disease progression, uh, risk stratification of patients. Uh, for example, in cardiovascular flow, we know that vessels adapt uh, to maintain optimal wall shear stress values. So we can predict how the vessels will remodel in a specific patient and uh, predict whether an intervention is needed or we can treat conservatively with uh, medication, for example. And um, yes, then uh, in diagnostics, uh, obtaining information that's not available from imaging alone by, by getting uh, quantitative data. And then the uh, last thing would be modeling uh, different treatment scenarios, that's also a very powerful capabilities of computations. You cannot do that with imaging or with anything else, really. You can image only existing conditions. With computational modeling, you can model different post-operative scenario and decide which treatment option is better, safer, uh, less likely to cause complications. More areas of medicine where you expect significant progress in, in one of the things that I think will be important is sort of an is interaction between computational mechanics and information. I mean, our bodies are information carriers. Uh, we can't do this without that, and and that's a, that's an area where um, I think there are good, good, really good, good topics out there. On, on so then, perhaps following up on this, what do you think is the main limitation of the computational approach? What is limiting the computational approach uh, from uh, making a more uh, significant uh, impact on medicine and that is routinely used in clinical practice? Is uncertainty uh, on the governing mechanisms or? Uh, Lots of limitations exactly uh, on certain parameters or large number of parameters that are involved or not large number of physics that are involved in the process. And uh, like, and these days we see more and more of um, deep learning or machine learning combined with uh, computational uh, engineering or coming into help of uh, classical physics-based modeling uh, and both together will be able to answer uh, questions by either uh, connecting the, the uh, data f op obtained from observation and experiments to uh, uh, expensive uh, computations and coming up with uh, either reduced order model or propagating the uncertainty in the parameters um, all the way through different levels of uh, model if, for example, you're dealing with um, multi-scale modeling where then it's important to propagate uncertainty f from one layer to the other. So these uh, these are challenges and, and uh, which uh, now people in the field of computational engineering are, are um, looking into more. For example, Perhaps this is going further away from uh, your question to medicine, but uh, something that I observed last week where we are t uh, attending um, American Physical Society Division of Fluid Dynamics Conference where more than like uh, 3,000 uh, talks are presented. Uh, like a few years ago, there were not as many talks as now we see this, um, this year on topics of um, deep learning and fluid dynamics calculation. And I'm sure they're the same going on in medicine conferences uh, and um, they evolve. Now, the question I have related to that, how can we make sure this is not used just as a black box without understanding the um, physics uh, and just forgetting about the physics and looking at a problem um, as a, 
uh, just a black box. Yeah, so now that you brought up this topic, I think this was probably one of the questions that everyone in the audience was expecting, which is uh, how, do you, how do you think that uh, machine learning and deep learning is going to impact uh, computational engineering? And maybe we can have the perspective of Professor Kai and Professor Prakash first. Yeah, I think uh, there have been uh, several efforts, I think, recently on where people have tried to do uh, machine learning uh, combined with some sort of finite element uh, models. Um, but I think with limited success uh, until now, but uh, we, um, uh, uh, even we <laughs> are working, I think uh, if you ask anybody these days, everybody is trying to do machine learning um, to try to expand uh, uh, how, what their models can learn. One way I think uh, we see uh, things working out is, uh, you know, uh, in, in finite element models, uh, there are lots of uncertainties which, uh, uh, which uh, the models, um, you know, you cannot really predict them uh, how, uh, for example, I have a, you know, structures background, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit from the structural engineering perspective, buildings and bridges. There's, uh, the level of uncertainty is so high that uh, you know people have difficulty uh, even trusting the uh, uh, the computer model results that sometimes come out of these uh, these models. But um, deep learning could uh, uh, maybe supplement uh, you know the way we determine parameters. We can uh, we can learn certain patterns of how uh, material properties materials under different circumstances behave, things that we cannot do experiments on. So um, I think there is some future, but we have to proceed cautiously on deep learning and uh, finite elements. Professor Kai. Okay. I, uh, well, first of all, I'm not in engineering, so I'm more uh, uh, theoretic. Uh, series. Um, we start the. Uh, using uh, machine learning to solve in the uh, PDEs. More or less, we treat the uh, DNN as a uh, new class of uh, functions. The, so far, the experience is good. Of course, still cannot compete with the finite. We're still doing the uh, one-dimensional sense. Uh, but the potential seems like it has a lot of potentials. Um, for example, is anything the problem Finite cannot do well. The machine learning probably give us the potential, like approximate the uh, uh, boundary or interior layer sense extremely nicely. Um, of course, for the deep learning right now, the fundamentals we, is not there. We don't understand what is approximation property. We don't understand how to solving the minimization problem effectively. So all these issues, but seems like we see a lot of potentials. Uh, one sense I talking to a Professor Hughes this morning is the one sense we didn't, if we use a finite element, we have a mesh. And mm -hmm. the DN does not have mesh. Not only that, uh, they even have the nicer feature from the movie mesh. So that's the reason approximate very well. But of course, for simple problems, we still take days to train in that. So it's not competitive now, but there's a lot of potential. As a, and the other thing is, of course, I'm doing that is because the uh, student pushing me to towards to this direction, because they weren't looking for a job in the in the industry. And if I can add one sentence, uh, I think it goes both ways. It's not only that deep learning can benefit uh, computational modeling and engineering, but engineering and computational modeling can also benefit deep learning approach. We can um, reduce the uh, uh, training data sets. Since we already have some knowledge about the system, uh, we can substantially reduce the amount of data that we need to train our neural nets because we can uh, impose some uh, laws of physics and, um, and then we can learn um, the system behavior much faster and more reliably. Professor Hughes, maybe you want to comment I, I was gonna, uh, I could kind of connect all of these things to the question you asked again, like what about uh, uh, the future, and I think whatever is done uh, in a field like computational medicine, whether it's data-driven or physics-based modeling or a combination of the two, whatever tools and, uh, and analytical capabilities uh, are developed, somehow to get that to the clinic, you have to go through clinicians. And uh, th that's really a challenge. 
because there are all sorts of things you can do and compute, and clinicians will have no idea what to make of it. Uh, in, in certain areas, there are metrics that they use that they have actually uh, utilized from something, imaging, catheterization, some type of a, a test. And so when you can compute that without that test, they understand that. But of course, you could give them a lot more. They don't understand that, and they don't know what to do with it, and you, you can't ram it down anybody's throat. Anytime you, you build a technology or a product, you have to figure out how it's going to be consumed and take it you know, across the finish line. And that's going to be a big, I think that's going to be a bigger challenge than most things, because you're dealing with uh, people that fundamentally do not understand what you're doing. And uh, on the other hand, as a computational scientist, you fundamentally don't understand what they know and what they're doing. So somehow that gap has to be bridged. And I think the key in, in that area is for partnerships and collaborations between clinicians and uh, research engineers and scientists to build technologies together that are utilizable and can be brought to, uh, brought to the clinic. Otherwise, you know, all the technology in the world doesn't do anything if uh, people can't easily use it. It has to be easy and fast because they work on a different time scale. So following up on this, do you think it's going to, to, to fully achieve this, do you think we're going to have to train, completely train from scratch a new generation of engineers who have in their core skill set like a very strong interdisciplinary uh, type of knowledge? I, th I think already you're seeing some things like that to a certain extent. I mean, there are computational medicine programs right now. Uh, we're, st we're starting one ourselves in Texas. And so you, you want people to be uh, skilled at scientific computing. You want them to be skilled in mathematics and understand basic physics and engineering principles and all the technologies. But you want that to have a, a strong application area in, in medicine. And so people are going to be trained in that. I mean, you can't be trained in everything. And throughout your life, you have to retrain yourself on new things because things keep changing. But uh, I don't know that everybody has to have that kind of background. I mean, you know, problems in the real world are sur uh, solved usually with teams of people. It's not just one person sitting in a corner with a pad and a pencil. You have teams of people. And people with different skill sets can be brought to bear on these types of problems. So you might be a civil engineer, and you can work in medicine, as you know. You know. And uh, uh, in fact, you know, if you think about uh, the history of medicine, probably the greatest contribution to health on Earth was the development of clean water systems. That was done by civil engineers. So you can, uh, you, you, you can play a role, but you have to partner. You have to be a good collaborator. You have to enjoy working with other people. That's the real world, you know. Okay, so <laughs> I'd like now uh, that you, all of you share an anecdote from your life. So as you know, many of the researchers who do computational work, including me, at some point, they face some resistance against, you know, computational work and uh, trust in the models and the computation. So I would like you to share an anecdote when you had to face this resistance. Can I start with that? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a lot of resistance stories. You know? I was a member of the resistance, you know. <laughs> no, uh, I, st I first started doing uh, finite element research in the, in the research and development laboratory at General Dynamics Electric Boat in Connecticut. And I got excited about the idea of finite elements and, and talked my boss into supporting activity in that area. So within a year, we had developed, in fact, well, another funny anecdote is he started the finite element development group. I, this was before I even did my PhD. So he put some guy in charge of the group, and I was the group. <laughs> but one year later, we had a 57,000 line code solving many, many problems in the laboratory. And there was an analysis group in there that was using very archaic technology. And it became a, a real battle. It was a war, and the director of the laboratory said that uh, after a while, he would decide on the future direction of, 
development and research, whether it's going to be the finite element method or this older technology that I won't mention. And uh, <coughs> he said he'd decide on a Friday afternoon. And uh, on Monday, if you were not prepared to sign up for the direction, you could hand in your resignation. <laughs> this was an exciting day. And uh, uh, so th this other group was led by, you know, the, the resistance. He was really resisting finite element technology. But the director of the lab said at 5 o'clock, then he went home, he said, uh, we're, we're going to be doing the finite element method in the future. <laughs> and so this guy who had fought tooth and nail was driving me crazy, uh, trying to obstruct everything I was doing on Monday was an enthusiastic finite element man. <laughs> <laughs> so. <clears throat> okay, maybe more anecdotes. I'm sure there are many of them. One little story, not as exciting as Tom's story, but <laughs> one little story. I, when I worked in industry, uh, I was doing a lot of failure detection problems, root cause identification problems. And I worked at IBM. There was one mainframe that failed in Rome and that went, sent the company into panic. So you don't want your mainframes, $10 million mainframe, to, cr to fail. So we had to do some root cause analysis. And a colleague, a metallurgist colleague and I, we always worked together in groups, as Professor Hughes said. And we thought it might be a problem with some specific process issue during fabrication of circuit boards. So I had some finite element model which had some fancy contact, nonlinearity, et cetera, et cetera. And I showed it to my first level manager who, was a, who has a PhD in uh, mechanical engineering but in thermal sciences, he was a believer. And then I showed it to my second level manager who also, has a P who also had a PhD in mechanical engineering but in some experimental mechanics, he didn't believe anything that I showed, and he was very concerned about my going and presenting to this senior VP level person who had been assigned to oversee this problem because it was costing the company millions of dollars a day to shut down the assembly line. So we had to go present every day to, until we've, to show that we had understood the problem and we have solved it. So my second level manager was very worried that I might be sacrificing the entire department by presenting some results which are not correct. So fortunately, it turned out OK, because the third level manager who didn't have any PhD, but he was convinced, and we went and presented to the senior reviewer, and everything worked out OK. So I think we come with biases. I think my message is we come with our biases based on our training. And somehow, computational mechanicians seem to have more bias against them than <laughs> experimental mechanicians. <coughs> Uh, my PhD, uh, I was hearing from one of the more seniors that if you do experiments, uh, everyone believes in what you're doing, but you don't believe in what you did. And if you're doing computations, no one believes in what you're doing, but you, you're the only one believing in what you're doing. So for a few weeks, I was thinking, maybe I shouldn't do computations. Maybe I should do experiments. Uh, but as time uh, passed, I, I learned that, well, what is most important is the experimentally validated computational models that you came up with, and everyone believes in it, and life is <laughs> good. So, you know, maybe following up on that, <coughs> on perhaps a little bit on the other end, when I talk to people in the engineering community, the broad engineering community, uh, be it academia or industry, somehow the general belief is that everything in the computational methods area is kind of done and known and is already packed into the uh, commercial software programs that anyone can use. And, you know, my opinion is almost the opposite to that, I would say. Uh, uh, because, you know, th there are a lot of, I see a lot of, at many different levels, a lot of computations that you cannot really trust at all, that they are uh, bogus at many different levels, not only numerical analysis, but even physical principles. So my opinion is qu quite the opposite, I would say, and I would like to know what, what you think about that. So, uh, you know, I get this question from students uh, sometimes uh, that uh, uh, when, when I'm teaching a finite element course, you know, what software are you going to be teaching? And my answer to them is uh, the best software, best finite element software uh, that is, which is going to be your pseudocode that you will code up in MATLAB. 
Um, so uh, no finite element software, I believe, will give you, um, you know, the the absolute correct answer to to a problem, to a real problem. But um, um, uh, you know, if uh, when you get to code, when you get to understand the uh, the equations that you're solving and get to code them, then you really uh, have a better understanding of the limitations of your model. So, uh, and maybe, you know, uh, a quote that comes to mind uh, from Professor George Box, who is a, a statistician, was that all, all models are wrong, um, but some are useful. And uh, basically what that says is that you got to understand the limitations of your model, and when you apply it, you stay within those limitations and life will be good. If you try to push the limits, apply a model where it's not applicable, uh, which is what I feel you know, uh, has led to this mistrust of finite element models, people trying to apply it to situations where they should not be uh, applied or they are, where they are not validated. Um, <clears throat> I don't know the much about the application in engineering, um, but the, uh, in terms of computation, uh, I do have a uh, go to the lab quite often. Um, still, one of the problems haven't been really solved is the uh, accuracy control of the simulations. Once we have the simulations, we even don't know how good is our simulation is. So in particular for the very difficult problems, that's, uh, we basically don't know much about that. Uh, in the mathematic community or in the uh, computational community, there is a, a field that exists for 40 years. We call it the uh, posterior error estimation, which can help for the simple problems. But for still, for the hard problems, our basic principle does not apply. So this is uh, one, I think that's probably one of the reasons is the uh, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, the DOE was talking about predictable computation, which is basically how do, uh, how do we assess how accurate is our simulation. So we can trust and we can use that for design or prediction. More. Yeah, one of the aspects that I think continues on is this question, what physical reality are we uh, projecting onto a computation? I and mean, I think we talk about elasticity, yeah, that might be settled in a large domain, but there are certainly mechanisms out there that have shown us that Linear elasticity or uh, local elasticity is not sufficient for each and every material that we encounter. Uh, take a foam, and, uh, and that foam has a, has a size dependence in the mechanical response, and thi similar things occur in, in plasticity. And so we will have to be careful about on, on what physical reality we project forward and, and know these limitations on, on where our simulations are, are valid and, and where they are not. And that, that is a continuous battle that I think will not, thankfully not end, right, and hopefully employ many of us in the long term. <coughs> the main purveyors of the line that everything's done are commercial software companies. Their marketing departments will tell everybody that they talk to that every problem is solved, all you have to do is buy their software. And uh, if you believe that, well, you believe anything. Uh, and if you, uh, if you want to uh, get a good sense of what these people are like, you should read uh, Dilbert. Dilbert uh, give you a good insight into the marketing departments of, of various technology firms. OK, so maybe now uh, we can take uh, questions from the audience. So. Questions from perhaps students? Yeah. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I have several questions, but I, I don't know which one should I do. Maybe to Professor Hughes and maybe to all of you. So. I guess all of you have developed some good idea. My question is, how do you develop? I mean, something that is growing up in your head for several weeks, several months, or is something that just come out 
just all of a sudden. So how how is the process? Hmm. How do you come up with great ideas? <laughs> you know, I think it, it, when when you're trying to you know, develop a, a technology or you're trying to solve a problem, you kind of carry it around with you. And sometimes an idea just occurs to you. You know, all of a sudden, you're taking a shower. My wife claims I take the longest showers in the world because I start <laughs> thinking about things and I forget that I've washed my back 30 times, you know. <laughs> but you know, ideas just come at any time. And, uh, it's, I don't think, this, it's hard to describe processes like this. They're not like linear processes. There's nothing you can kind of really do, you know. You just have to be really committed to the problem. It's, the wheels are always turning if you are, and then things occur to you, in my experience. I had a good idea yesterday on the plane. <laughs> 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 on a plane, anything is better than paying attention to what you're doing, but that was a good idea. Any more answers for this question, or? Yeah, no, I think uh, uh, to me uh, that's basically you keep trying um, and don't be afraid of failure. So um, maybe the best thing that will come out of uh, your uh, your thoughts and research, not all the ideas are going to be good. <laughs> so you keep trying and failing, and then trying again until it works. That's uh, that's my two cents. You have to work. <laughs> you have to work on things. Einstein said what? 98% yeah. perspiration and 2% inspiration or something like that. I don't know which came first either. You know? <laughs> uh, Professor Reitz, I think you wanted to say something. Well, also going to conferences, reading papers, staying current, uh, you need to know what's important, uh, what is um, relevant in the field, what would be of interest to um, mm -hmm. people you're collaborating with. What, what are the problems that would be um, important to, to solve? And as you keep thinking about that, then eventually, suddenly you will have this um, flashlight and you will get an idea. Um, yeah. <coughs> Um, so we spoke a little bit, I mean, all of our lectures uh, focused on problems that are very discrete uh, that uh, relate to using computers to model systems that are discrete. But can we also throw some light on how do we w use computational power to solve continuous systems and complex challenges like, let's say, we spoke about water. So uh, any light on that front? My question is open to the whole panel. So who wants to respond to that? Well, I mean, you know, c continuous systems in some sense are, the solutions are living in infinite dimensional spaces. And the way you make things in infinite dimensional spaces tractable is you discretize and project them into finite dimensional, large, but finite dimensional spaces. That's the finite element method, finite difference method, spectral method, everything. These are all analyses of continuous systems of equations, but they're done in uh, a discrete way. You have to make the calculations finite to do it on a computer. I think we have another question in the back. Yeah. <coughs> um, so I, I appreciate the uh, opinions and the thoughts from, from the panel. Uh, my question is related to something we spoke about earlier about resistance to kind of simulations and, and models and things like that. And I, there's a lot of experience on the panel there, and I just wanted to get your opinions of kind of, because uh, as engineers, as scientists, we are always seeking what is the answer, right? What is the best way to do something? Um, but more and more, I, I understand that it's a lot more political than that, especially when you go into industry and into, you know, working in groups, because um, everybody has different opinions. So what are your thoughts on, on how to best, you know, bridge that gap and help bring someone onto your side, if you will, um, and kind of how to work within those groups and how to, how to bring people to your side, if, if that makes sense.
try to convince them in a rational way, and if you can't, punch them in the nose. <laughs> There is another question there. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank all the speakers for the wonderful uh, panel discussion. It was quite enlightening. One thing I wanted to, I mean, get opinions by the panelists on is typically a lot of, most of the stuff what we design as mechanical engineers is built for a like cyclic failure, say like fatigue. And b uh, probably like a few decades back, we use empirical models or curve fits, in fact, to calibrate our models just from statistics. And now at we are actually using finite elements and other computational methods in conjunction with statistical data to characterize these models. And all of a sudden, we are at the phase where now a topic like machine learning with a whole probably the physics of the problem is like a total black box. And how, uh, how is this particular aspect of the problem going to evolve? Is there any way that we could like bridge everything together or is it one, like something like a machine learning which is probably more efficient to predict but takes more time to train rather than a sim computational simulation which takes more time to get the results but we know the physics of the problem. How are we going to address this gap? And I would like to open this question to all the panelists and so that I can get different views on it. Thank you. What you described is a balance of two things. So itself is an optimization problem, which you can optimize for to see like for what type of problems, which, uh, which approach makes sense. And I guess it depends on the, how complex is the physics, how, how much data you have, and like how you can, uh, how much of experimental data you have, how uh, computational expensive is your model. And combination of those will set to the solution. So there is no single solution for all problems. But yet I think that we will see the fusion of, um, well, if you will, imaging or experimental data and computational models, you would have, um, fusion of different modalities, you would see um, high resolution um, numerical models and low resolution experimental data and um, combining them you can get sort of the fidelity of um, uh, experimental uh, results or imaging data with um, resolution and accuracy of um, computational models. So yeah, it would be a combination of these different modalities to get a um, better description of the problem. Yes, another question. Okay. Testing, okay. Um, thank you for all the opinions and uh, you've talked about some uh, resistance from the outer world. Now I want to have some um, advices from maybe aged minds. Like uh, I want to talk about the uh, resistance from your inner, inner, uh, from your, your, your yourself, because for uh, us like PhD students, we want some good publications. If uh, I become a professor, I want to get promoted. So uh, I have those pedestrian steps that that is keeping uh, getting my time. But I also have something that I really want to do. S uh, but so so it's kind of uh, something uh, my, my uh, real world. Uh, obligations are, are pushing me back from what we re uh, what I really want to do so um, I, I want to just have some uh, your your uh, maybe can, can you share some uh, experience like when you were young how, how do you deal with this uh, situation I don't remember when I was young <laughs> <laughs> but uh, y you might be surprised to find out that these types of uh, Conflicts never go away, you know. I still have lots of things that I want to do, but I can't do because I have many obligations to satisfy. So it's nice if you can just ignore everything but the things you want to do, but that's not life. You have to somehow find, find the right balance or the best you can. 
it's, a, it's a psychological problem, not a scientific problem. You know. Okay, so we have only a couple of more minutes. So uh, I would like maybe to conclude the panel by asking our, our panelists to give a very quick advice for all the graduate students in the room. So if you had to give a quick advice to them, what would that be? Do your homework. <laughs> I don't know, hard working. So I probably would say that trying to understand sense, trying to get a more deep understanding, then everything becomes easy. Yeah, no, I second that. Uh, make sure you understand the limitations of your model and then um, start simple and then go complex. Yeah, I would say you need to know math because math is our language. And you need to know your domain. You need to know the area where you're applying your knowledge. You really need to know the systems that you are modeling or analyzing. So it's an interdisciplinary thing. You have to know your tools, you have to know physics, and you also have to know the domain, which is not easy. But that's what, what it takes. Relative to, let's say, graduate studies or research, find a topic that really fascinates you, uh, and that helps a lot. Opinion is that you should value every experience that you can get and choose a wide variety of experiences because you will get your insights from something that's completely unrelated to your main topic. Choose a wide variety of experiences. In my career, I've wandered around quite a bit. I started my thesis was in bone biomechanics, and then I went to work for IBM, and then I'm in academia doing computational modeling. So I think every experience gives you insight that's very valuable later on. Okay, so then I would like to thank you all for coming here, and of course I would like to thank our panelists for their time and their thoughts, uh, which are uh, very useful to all of us. So thank you very much. <laughs>